All right, EJ. We're full of sushi and udon on this nice, cloudy, what is it, Monday? <laughs> uh, it's I've, one of those days that ends in Y. I've, I've lost track of time at this point. It's Friday when this comes out uh, yes. in a few weeks. Uh, we are wrapping up NFC North today. We're making division predictions. We're talking about best additions, best draft picks, and also, uh, in some cases, what went wrong last year for uh, for a few of the teams in this division. So, lots to go over today. Jay, roll the intro. Welcome to the Bootleg Football Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Coleman, here with my wonderful co-host, EJ Snyder, uh, commuting down to L.A. from <laughs> Seattle this time of year to go over every single team, every single division. Today is NFC North Wrap-Up Day. We are concluding the first full week of this series. Yes. Only seven more weeks to go. I'm going to think more about the first part than the second part. It's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and a marathon that we have willingly extended every single year at this point. Uh, when we first started this show, we were taking things easy on ourselves, only doing three-hour podcasts. And then we had the wild idea of like, oh, let's just split it up into four. It'll turn it into 45-minute episodes. And then that turned into five-hour-plus long episodes, and we made even more work for ourselves. But, uh, you know, for whatever reason, people still like like listening to this. So here we are, like third year doing this, I think, now. Correct. Uh, again, talking NFC North today, uh, we're going to start off by talking about results last year to try to give some context for what we think going into this year. Obviously, we did individual team episodes where we did deep dives into scheme and tendencies and every single addition and subtraction. So if you're an individual fan of NFC North team, go check that uh, individual episode out as well to get even more of a deep dive. We're kind of looking at the division as a whole today. Uh, last year, it was weird, to say the least. <laughs> uh, all these teams in terms of power score, well, most of these teams in terms of power score were very similar, but had wildly different results. Yeah, Minnesota had a very strange season. We thought they were more of a mid-team, but they ended up with 13 wins. Won the division. That was, uh, we called it fool's gold towards the later season, predicted their early playoff demise. Really didn't think that win total sort of accurate, accurately reflected their true power as a team. Lions were second with nine wins, Green Bay third with eight, and Chicago brought up the rear with three, of course, earning the first overall pick in the draft. The only playoff participant were the Vikings. Uh, and in terms of late season surge teams, teams that finished up strong, both Detroit and Green Bay were four and one in their last five. So teams that were sort of building um, Green Bay has, I would say, larger changes. The Lions are really just looking to bolster the defense. Again, if you want all those details, check out the individual episodes. But that's how the division shook out last year. And that translated to their bootleg power score rankings. If you've watched the individual episodes, bootleg power score is something we've come up with to try and formulate how good is a team at playing football. And we've sort of boiled that down to six measurements and then taken an average. Those averages work out to the Packers at 16. Again, keep in mind the lowest score is the best, being number one, kind of like golf score. Packers were at 16, Vikings at 18, Lions at 19, and then Bears dropped off at 24. So, that's pretty representative. It's our first shot at looking at how power score stacks for a division. And then we decided to do a divisional power score and just add those four scores together so that we can compare division to division. So you won't have very much context for this one, but the division power score for the NFC North is 77. Again, lower score is better. Um, you'll see next week when we get into the AFC North that that scores a little bit lower slash higher. Um, a lower number, meaning a higher score. So we're going to be able to do this at the end of all these divisional rankings and stack the entire league based on power score and then look at divisional ranks one versus the other. So um, not a terribly powerful division overall, a pretty balanced division with the exception of the Bears. They, they beat off. each other up for the most part. Yep. I will say this. A lot of people might be looking and, and saying, wait a minute, the Packers had a better "Quote unquote better power score than the Vikings. Though the Vikings had 13 wins, um, what gives? 
if you look at the Packers last year in terms of a lot of different key metrics, again, we're doing uh, rushing EPA, passing EPA, as well as rush defense EPA, pass defense EPA, um, you know, points allowed, points against, differential, all that kind of stuff. Like basically the key main numbers that represent offense, defense, and just can you score and stop other people from scoring. They were better on average. Like they didn't translate it into wins because the Vikings just had weird fourth quarter voodoo going on the entire year <laughs> and credit the Vikings for that. For sure. And the Packers didn't really get their shit together until the last month and a half of the year. But in that last month and a half of the year, you know, when they went on that four and one run, they were a good enough team to drag their overall season long score better than Minnesota. Packers did have their issues. They they had some pretty brutal key injuries that kind of stopped them from doing what they really wanted to do schematically. But going into the year this year, and if you watch the individual episodes, I think that's that's pretty clear. The Packers addressed their problems personnel wise. They are healthier going into this year as well. Even though they don't have Aaron Rodgers, the roster itself, you could argue, is way better. And it was already a good roster on paper. They just had to deal with a lot of injuries. If Jordan Love is just average, wouldn't be surprised if they're a better team than the Vikings. We also thought the Vikings are going to be a good team too, but I think this whole narrative of the NFC North is going to have a down year, I don't necessarily buy that because A, the Bears were the worst team. They're way better. The Packers finished with the third record in the division. They're way better. The Vikings aren't worse, and the Lions aren't worse. This could end up being one of the best, if not the best division in the NFC when all is said and done, even though these power scores are relatively average. Yeah, and I think that in the conversation about power score versus win totals, right, we see this every year. We see teams that are very talented and play very well and have some bad breaks, whether it's with injury, whether it's with game management, whether it's just, look, it's not a round ball. It bounces funny and they don't catch the bounces. You know, everybody says, look, they're a good team. They're a strong team. They're a powerful team. And, you know, game management got away from them and they lost three, maybe four games that they should have won. That happens every year. So power score, we hope, is more representative, again, because it is for your statistics for the entire year, all 17 games, that it is representative of overall, they're pretty good at this or overall, they're generally terrible at this, but they got lucky in one more games and wins are still the thing. You know, don't get that. Don't get that twisted. Uh, wins are still the thing at the end of the year. But for everybody that says, oh, you know, Vikings weren't flawed. They were great. How could a 13 win team be flawed? That's not great logic. And we hope this evens it out a little bit. Now, in terms of notable free agency additions, most of these teams had pretty good, you know, March and early April free agency uh, seasons, I guess you could call it. Packers were the exception because really the only thing they did was was do a money dump through the Aaron <laughs> Rodgers trade to save a bunch of future money. They didn't really have cap space to be aggressive in free agency. Not that the Packers historically are super aggressive in free agency anyway. They've had a couple of years of it, but it's not, they're not a spendy <laughs> team. You know, they, they typically like to spend on their own guys. Uh, and so, you know, they're N.A. because they just didn't really spend money. Mm -hmm. They more just saved money, whereas the other teams did dump a pretty significant chunk of change into free agency. So you and I were tasked with each pick, uh, each picking our single favorite free agency addition across the entire division. We only get one name out of these three teams, essentially, that that spent. Who is your number one free agency addition and or trade yeah we should say that it includes any sort of existing player in the league being brought on that could be free agency or trade drafts or draft picks are going to be a different category so in this category of free agency or trade for me it's got to be dj moore this was one of the key moves of the offseason league-wide getting an alpha wide receiver for justin fields is something that's been necessary for a while a lot of people were hoping it was going to be Allen Robinson in his last year, which was Justin's first year. Didn't work out that way. Last year, they just kind of punted. They brought in a bunch of guys, but they didn't really make an attempt despite, you know, well, hue they didn't, and cry. They didn't have money to make an attempt. Yeah, <laughs> didn't, despite a very large uproar from the Chicago fan base. You got to do something. Ryan Poles held firm, didn't do that. This season, he was determined, 
And it's one of the reasons that they ended up making that trade uh, down out of the number one spot with Carolina because Carolina had a receiver in DJ Moore that they wanted. And if you listen to the sort of fallout of how that trade occurred, that was a linchpin of that trade. If there was no DJ Moore to Chicago, that pick wasn't going to Carolina. They wanted to accomplish that. DJ Moore was better than anybody that was available in free agency for the wide receiver spot, and it just fits on so many levels. By all accounts, he's rejuvenated. Of course, everybody's in the best shape of their life at this time of the year, but DJ Moore, a receiver I've loved since he came out, has been very productive in Carolina. No reason to think that won't continue in Chicago, and it's something they just desperately needed. My number one is going to be C.J. Gardner-Johnson with the Lions, which is not uh, the longest term or even the most expensive deal in the division. But I think it's the best deal, considering the money that they spent on him. His cap number this year is $4.5 million because they tacked on a void year for an extra two. So it was technically a one-year, $6.5 million deal, but it was the way they structured it. It was really like four and a half now, two next year. But I can't see Jay Gardner-Johnson for anything less than 10 was unexpected. You get him on a one-year mercenary contract because for whatever reason, the, the free agent market wasn't going his way. And yeah. so he decided to take a cheap contract on an ascending team that should be a hell of a lot better on defense. And if you go watch the Lions episode, you'll understand why we think that. He could very easily be making triple this next offseason if he has the type of year that we think he can have he's very versatile you can play him you know down the slot he can play free safety he's tough against the run he does everything right he is he is really really a perfect fit for what they need uh in that secondary which we expect to be very man coverage heavy once again uh now this is a team that has what, four uh, hybrid safety nickel types in the same secondary? So he's just kind of like one extra one, but I think he also might be the best one that they have. And to get him at a $4.5 million cap number is, it's kind of absurd, to be honest. Larceny. Yeah, yeah. It's, I still really want to know what the hell his free agent market actually was, because I guarantee you it wasn't that. But hey, Lions got a good one for basically no money. It was, uh, from a value perspective, that was my top one. Uh, what about uh, draft picks? Your favorite draft pick across all the NFC North teams? Who was it? Yeah, a lot of good draft picks in this division. Most of these teams had very strong drafts. And while it would be easy for me to go with Darnell Wright or Roshan Johnson, everybody knows I'm a big Roshan Johnson fan. Overall, in terms of where a player landed, in terms of fit and his ability to contribute right away, I've got to go with Jordan Addison to the Vikings. He is going to be their day one, number three wide receiver. He is going to be productive, I think, from game one and make a difference in that offense. He's an improvement coming in over, you know, a veteran player player in Adam Thielen, who throughout his career has been very good, had a bit of a down year last year, but not fell off the cliff. He, you know, still caught a lot of balls for them. And Jordan Addison is going to be a clear upgrade for them in multiple ways and really expand that offense. And it's really rare that you can say that sort of truthfully right off the crack about a rookie coming into an NFL program that was already good. It's not uh, a terrible team that was lacking wide receivers, so he's the obvious best option. He might even be the third best wide receiver on his own team, but in the role that he comes into, he's going to be extremely valuable. He's sort of custom made for it. Just feels like a perfect match. And you also have to factor in the financials behind it too. Uh, Rookie receivers in terms of value for what you get if they pop off are some of the most valuable contracts in the NFL. Justin Jefferson, in a wide receiver market where the top guys are getting 30 plus million dollars a year now, he's maybe the best receiver in the entire league, (laughs) making a fraction of a fraction of that. So Jordan Addison, knowing that Justin Jefferson is going to completely shatter the receiver market whenever he happens to sign, who knows, maybe he'll sign before this even comes out, because there's been talks that he might. That, that they're trying to, yeah. to do that, right? Um, a lot of that hinges on what's going on with Dalvin, which also maybe he gets traded by the time this goes out. But anyway, taking Addison and getting a 
minimum five, possibly six years of contract control on a very valuable position, a very expensive position that you know you're already going to have to dump a ton of money into to keep Jefferson around. This is going to be a very valuable contract, not just a valuable player. So I think we're going to see a lot more receivers go in the first round. Um, I mean, already a lot of receivers go in the first round, but with each passing year, it's just going to be more and more and more as the receiver market gets crazier and crazier and crazier because it's the only way to get financially responsible receiving production at this point is to get that fifth-year option. Yeah, we're going to see them sneak into those last five or eight spots in the first round of the draft where typically that was uh, quarterbacks and it was like reserved for quarterbacks and edge rushers where people were like, oh, let's get that fifth-year control and, again, a very expensive position wide receivers crept up there and it has that level of value. And if it's the, you know, fifth best quarterback and he's, you know, sort of clearly going to be a number two on your roster and he's going to have to sit for a year or two or a guy like Addison that could be your third wide receiver, but start, you're going to tip it towards the wide receiver, even over the quarterback, which seems crazy, but money wise, it's not that far off. I mean, A.J. Brown's getting $25 million a year right now. Once Jefferson signs at 30-plus, because Tyreek's at 30, even though his deal's kind of, I don't want to call it fake, but it's not. It's odd. It's odd, right? Um, But Jefferson's definitely getting 30-plus. Jamar's going to get 30-plus. A.J. Brown at 25 is going to look real damn good within the next 12 months. Yes. And it's only going to go up from there. Uh, In terms of my favorite draft pick, getting away from receiver, even though he's going to be used basically like a receiver. That's Luke Musgrave with the Packers. Again, fully appreciate the Bears draft here. Mm-hmm. I very easily could have gone with Darnell Wright or Tucker Craft, or sorry, Darnell Wright or uh, or Roshan or Dexter or Tyreek Stevenson. Like the Bears had a lot of good picks that I was thinking about. But in terms of value for where they got this player in the draft, mm-hmm. plus immediate impact. Luke Musgrave, I think, is going to be one of the very few rookie tight ends that we see that has immediate impact because there's not really a veteran in front of him. There's not really competition for snaps other than fellow rookie Tucker Kraft, but I think Musgrave's just better. Yeah. Not that Kraft is bad. Like I love no. Kraft, but like Musgrave, I think, is a better version of Tucker Kraft. He's huge. He's smooth. He's fast. He's a legitimate seam ripper. Reminds me a lot of uh, of Tyler Eifert before Eifert's injuries, you know, kind of derailed his career. But like young Tyler Eifert was freaking unstoppable. And I feel like Luke Musgrave is going to be a similar type of player, which not only is a rookie, but also by year two, we could look at him as one of the most productive tight ends in the entire league because he's very talented. He's in a tight end friendly system that feeds that position historically. I think sky's the limit for him and, and Green Bay got a really, really good player. I think he can be contributing this season. I don't know that that's all going to show up in like fantasy contribution, right? It's not necessarily going to be a ton of yards or touchdowns because typically rookie tight ends don't do that. Very few of them ever uh, have high levels of production that way. But if you're looking at production in an offense, also in his ability to block because he can, he's large frame. He's, I'm not going to say he's a rocked up guy, but he's a well-muscled guy. We're going to see him add weight uh, over time. That two-way production in terms of how he helps make their offense go in a football sense, he could be very productive if you're looking at as a combined metric, um, certainly by the end of the year. And I think his production will only increase sort of in year two, familiarity of the system as Jordan Love gets more comfortable with the offense, with him in particular. Um so don't don't hang your hat on super high production, either in yards or touchdowns, although I think he will be a very good red zone target for them. Um, but also his ability to not leave the field. And like you said, he's going to get a lot of snaps. I will say this, though, even if he isn't the most productive tight end in the league right now, if you're doing like best ball drafts on underdog, our, our main sponsor, he's tight end 30. He's not going to be the 30th. Pro, most productive tight end yeah. in the league like that seems crazy to me so yeah. if i'm again if i'm value hunting for fantasy like luke musgraves who i'm going after because there is not 29 tight ends in the league they're going to be more productive than him in my opinion like the the role is there the skills are there as long as jordan love doesn't shit himself every time he walks out on the field luke musgraves is going to be 
way better than tight end 30. So again, if you're doing best ball drafts, you're getting him in like the last round was his ADP. Two, yeah, 209, six. You're getting him in like the last round. Go Just for it. Take him in every single team. It's it's a lottery ticket that is very likely to at least uh, you know, give you a few games of a pretty crazy. And that's pops. all you need in best ball, right? That's you don't literally have, all you need. You don't have to pick the right weeks and hope that he that he goes off or or wait till the second half of the season when he warms up. If he's on your team, you're getting the points. He is gonna have some this year. He's gonna have some big receptions. He's gonna have some touchdowns. He's you know he's got long arms. He's pretty tall. He is a very fluid receiver for his size. He's he's gonna have some production. And again, best ball is like the ideal format for that because if you've got him on your team, it's just going into the kitty for the points. Uh, one quick uh, shameless plug, by the way, before we move on to division predictions, uh, promo code bootleg over underdog fantasy. They will match your deposit up to a hundred dollars. So whatever you deposit. Again, up to 100, they will double it on your account. You can use it on anything, whether it's best ball drafts, pickums, in any single sport. Uh, they will give you a lot of value there. Now, division predictions. You and I are uh, the same and also opposite <laughs> when it comes to division MVP and division offensive player of the year. We chose the same two players, we just put them in opposite spots. Those two players being Justin Jefferson and Justin Fields. For division MVP, I put Justin Fields. You put Justin Jefferson, the other Justin. For Offensive Player of the Year, you put Justin Fields. I put Justin Jefferson. Either way, I think it's safe to say that we are extraordinarily high on Justin Fields. That yes. he could potentially be this year's you know Jalen Hurts type rise. Justin Jefferson, we all know he's good. Like we couldn't get away with not putting him in one of these spots. Justin Fields, I think, is is truly the the kind of point of contention that maybe people people might bring up of like, how can you possibly anoint him after everything we've seen? The answer is because of everything we've seen, we we have a pretty good idea of what he's gonna be. Now he has a supporting cast, he has a structure around him. Again, there's a lot of young pieces that you're counting on here, but he has receivers. He has better protection. The offense, you know, Luke Getze, I think, showed the ability to adjust and and change things up midseason last year and create an offense out of thin air that just suddenly worked. Like, he can do that again. Mm -hmm. I have no reason to believe that Justin Fields is not going to be a massive, massive ascending talent this year, which is why I put him at MVP. And I think people that disagree with that did not watch enough Bears games last year. He can take over a game all by himself. And people think that's all he can do. Outside watchers think that's all he can do because that's what they saw. Well, the play broke down and he ran. Well, yeah, but he ran, you know, through the entire Eagles defense <laughs> for, 60, for 50 yards. <laughs> 60 yards and scored in, in a play that very few players in the league can run like that, and maybe only one or two other quarterbacks in the league could have pulled off a run like that. Um, there were a lot of passing plays that he delivered on. Ball was delivered to the right time, the right place. Uh, receiver wasn't able to get separation or, or didn't hold on to it. And look, he's got areas of growth, but there were so many plays that you just sort of scratched off before they even started to happen as – that's not a fair assessment because the center just folded and rolled over backwards or, uh, you know, whoever was playing left guard or right guard that week went the wrong way and there's a free rusher in his face in 0.5 seconds, you know, plays dead essentially. And sometimes he spun out of those and ran for 25 yards. So uh, the highlights kind of push people in the wrong direction. Now that he's got a stable offensive line that should be operating at a more professional level in front of him, he has that's a nice way of saying remotely fucking competent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's all they have to do is stay in the middle. They do not have to be a top 10 line. Like I'm not saying Chicago's line needs to be Cleveland's line or Justin won't be successful. Like they're 15 to 18th overall in line metrics. He will be fine. He has plenty of tools and he's got receivers to throw to. He's got a legit tight end two for the first time ever in his career. The running back stable is, you know, completely refreshed and I think a three-headed monster. I don't I don't think there's any drop off depending on which back you go to. It's just which flavor of run you're looking for. This is the best chance that we're going to get to see Justin Fields' powers. If he fails here, he's got an offensively minded 
offensive coordinator. He's got a line. He's got people to throw to. He's got great support from the run game, and he's still got those wheels, right? If that all breaks down, he can still put the team on his back, run 55 yards, and end up in the end zone. I think this is a year that he, you said, ascends. I think explodes. Chicago's a sleeping giant, third largest market in the country, haven't been good for a very long time. If Chicago starts to get good and Justin leads that charge, yeah, he's going to be the MVP of the division for sure, right? And dare I say... It's possible. More. Yeah, if he gets that hot, the spotlight will get very hot. Chicago is extremely hungry for a good team, a really good team, and a star. And he can be both. He can be a star leading a really good team. And if that happens, Chicago is going to wake the hell up. I mean, this is a century-old franchise that has literally never had, well, maybe one time ever, had a star quarterback. You know what they've never had? A 4,000-yard passer. (laughs) That's the one. It's insane. (laughs) No quarterback for the Bears has ever exceeded 4,000 yards. Even in the last 20 years of, uh, you know, the NFL leaning heavily towards the aerial attack, um, you know, people go, oh, well, you know, Kramer got close. Uh, Cutler would have had it if he didn't break his thumb. Well, it's true, but nobody's ever done it. It, you know, that would be one mark, but that's not even the mark that Justin's looking for, right? He's looking for double digit wins, a playoff berth, a playoff win, winning the division. Those are the things that he's looking for. And I think all those things are possible. Are they probable? No, there's a lot of ways to go and they haven't done it. There's no historical precedent. If it happens, He's going to be an absolute meteor. I also do want to take uh, one second, by the way, to acknowledge Justin Jefferson. Uh, again, everybody knows he's good. He's going like first overall in every single fantasy draft. It, we don't need to explain too much why we love Jefferson because he is one of the best do it all receivers, honestly, that I've seen in the last 10 years. He is worth every ounce of hype. He has been worth every ounce of hype since the moment he stepped on the field as a rookie. I really do think that if there is a receiver in the NFL who could push for league MVP, it's probably him. Mm -hmm. It's an uphill climb. It's a very uphill climb because quarterbacks are almost always going to win that. Maybe the occasional running back if they get 2,100 yards or something like that. Um, But Justin Jefferson really is that good. He is on the fast track to not just Hall of Fame, but first ballot Hall of Fame. If he keeps this up, he will go down as one of the best receivers ever. And so we couldn't keep him out of division MVP or offensive player of the year. Really, just whichever one doesn't one a, matter. One B. So he just he deserves to be talked about with that level of regard because he is that good. Now, in terms of defensive player of the year, you and I, I don't want to call it a disagreement. We just, you know, same position, different team. Uh, we just had different names here. I went with Rashawn Gary who I think you picked last year, Was right? my pick last yeah. year. I was going to bring that up. And if he didn't get hurt, maybe he would have been yep. of the division, right? Like, he's a phenomenal player. So, And I'm, I'm just kind of rolling that back with the same argument of like, hey, here's this top-tier elite edge rusher who's also an ass kicker against the run, can play anything from like stand-up edge to put him at four-eye every now and then. He could do that too. He's big, he's strong, he's quick, he's flexible. He's, he's everything you want, right? He's Rashawn Gary. If he stays healthy, he will make that push. Not just for division defensive player of the year, but league defensive player of the year. You, however, went a little bit uh, to over to left field, I would say, for a name that is perennially underrated. I mean, extremely underrated. And also, I think even among his own fan base might be underrated at this point. You highlighted Daniil Hunter. Yeah, and this has as much to do with the player as it does to do with his new defensive coordinator. So you're thinking Flores is going to scheme just outrageous amounts of one-on-ones for him. Well, if I was in his shoes, I would, right? I would look at my best athlete as a pass rusher who's had success, even had success last year in that absolute mess of a defense. Didn't get a lot of highlights because the defense overall was getting smoked, but He had a decent individual year. Now he's going to have a lot more support around him. 
and a very aggressive scheme. <laughs> One thing we know about that scheme is they're going to bring it, right? They're going to come. They are going to get after quarterbacks. And there's no better player on that defense to get after quarterbacks and Hunter. And it's as much about the change in the scheme around him and the talent around him um, as it is about, hey, guys, I was good last year, but I didn't have a lot of help. I was doing a lot of it myself. Uh, probably played too many snaps last year. Didn't get enough rest. Um, that may all change this year. And I, really a guy, I think, to watch in the first half of the season. If he starts rolling in the first six or eight games and, and gets into a rhythm, and the defensive play callers get into a rhythm of, hey, this is when we call his number and this is how. These are the plays that he likes. And he starts you know, getting to the quarterback in a way that we know he can early. He could keep that rolling. I could see that momentum going and he could be right there at the end of the year in conversation for all those awards. Well, we know this is a defense that, that should have a pretty damn high blitz rate under Flores. They're going to play a lot of man coverage as well. I would be willing to bet that a lot of their pressure schemes, whether they're bringing five or occasionally whether they're bringing six, it's going to be on the opposite side of Hunter. It's not going to be on the same side. A lot of people always say like, oh, what happens if they put so-and-so <laughs> right next to each other? It's like, no, 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 that's not what they're going to do. They're going to bring the pressure from the other side so that they have to slide that way to give Daniil not just a one-on-one, -on -one, but a one-on-one -on -one with a two-way go. Yeah, with they the gap. Want, they want the guard going the other way. Right, because they got to pick up a nose, and the center gets to pick up a linebacker, and the you know guard like they want all four guys sliding the other way, so that Daniel gets one on one, so that he can win in whatever way he needs to win. So yeah, I I wouldn't be shocked if he had a career year this year, just because a they're gonna have a lot of leads, and b I think Flores is gonna do everything in his power to make his job easier. One of the things he's gonna do is bring Ivan Pace down to mug gaps. There's, there's literally no other reason to have Ivan Pace on the roster other than to just be like, it's third and 10, it's Pace time, go absolutely murder a running back and pass bro. Right, and he's going to bring him down, he's going to creep him up, he's going to mug A or B gaps on Hunter's side, and it's going to be a pick em situation, right? The guard and the tackle are going to be like, well, we know this guy can come, and we know this guy is really good, we can't leave him over here. There's going to be that little false step, gotcha, step back, and Hunter's one on one with the tackle because the guard's like, I was here for the I can't. Well, because you get can't put a running back on him. Like, yeah. that's the thing. It's like, that's, that's how you get the guard to move is knowing that you cannot put a running back on Ivan Pace. He's going to kill them. Yeah. And he's going to be backpedaling, laughing. Like, <laughs> I just made a one on one for Hunter and you're doing nothing. You're standing there just looking for work. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're gonna we're gonna see some really creative schemes and some some really high pressure schemes and I think for Vikings fans that's gonna be fun. It's fun when your defensive team is getting after the quarterback and and you know they brought in a guy that can do that. So now in terms of offensive rookie of the year, both you and I were in uh, joint agreement on this one. Jordan Addison, uh, for all the reasons that we talked about before and all the value he brings to them as likely a slot receiver who also maybe could play a little bit outside here and there uh, if they want to put Justin Jefferson in the slot and, and run those slot fades that he's so dominant on. You can still put Addison outside, and, and he'll survive there just fine, but probably will primarily be a slot for them. I do want to say honorable mention. We were both really close to picking Roshan Johnson, but it's a tough backfield to figure out in terms of the carry split, so it's we can't truly justify it. Roshan's really fucking good, though. <laughs> yeah, something has to happen for that to occur. And that would be an injury, a little bit of missed time. Um, he gets off to a really hot start, takes advantage of the few carries that he does get, and breaks a couple. You know, there starts to be groundswell for like, hey, man, he had, you know, 60 yards and three carries last week. We should get him some touches. And and that sort of moves through the early season. It's it's all the right dominoes have to fall because he is surrounded, you know, or, or bookended by two really uh, accomplished veteran backs who are super talented in their own right. So it's not a clean uh, alignment towards role like we have with Jordan, right? Jordan's like, oh, he's Jordan Addison's going to be third receiver like day one. Roshan might be RB3 day one it's totally possible so a couple of things have to happen right he has to get on a roll but if he does 
I get the feeling he's going to be one of those players that once he gets regular playing time is going to be very hard to unseat. It's yes. going to be tough to take him out of the lineup if he is healthy because he is going to be producing. He's a very good pass protector, so you're not going to have those like, oh, we get the yards, but Justin's getting mangled. That's not going to be a thing. So once he gets any kind of significant playing time, he's going to get goal line carries. So again, touchdowns, even if you don't get the yards, are are going to be splashy. He's going to be up on red zone, right? People are going to be like, I don't know. I saw Roshan had two touchdowns last weekend. Like, why aren't they playing him number one? If that happens, he's got an outside shot at it. In terms of defensive rookie of the year, both of us also in agreement on this one. Couldn't go with anybody other than Jack Campbell from Iowa. Uh, one of the most physically gifted inside linebacker prospects of his generation. I mean, his not, RES score, I think it was like a 9.99, if I recall correctly. It was up there. He's 6'4", 250, jumps out the gym. You know, not elite long speed, but good enough long speed. Incredible agility scores. Like, he's just a freak athlete. While also being very disciplined, yeah. very well coached, he's got everything you want. Like taking him, I think it was 18th overall, if I recall correctly. A lot of people reacted negatively to that because, like, why are you taking a linebacker that high? Well, if you look at defenses around the league that are really good, they all have really good Mike linebackers. You can't have an elite defense without an elite Mike linebacker. And there's just not a lot of them. You know, the Niners, I don't want to say the Niners are good because of Fred Warner, but a lot of the stuff they do is only possible because they have Fred Warner and the advantage that he gives them, you know, not just in the pass game because he's great in coverage, but also as a run defender, like he's elite too. You can't have a top tier defense without having that spot locked down. So for all those reasons, I think Jack Campbell's an easy pick here. Um, I'm curious to see what the mix of snaps is mm -hmm. with him and then Anzalone and then Malcolm Rodriguez, who I was a huge fan of last year. And then, you know, eventually got on the field and was very productive and kind of justified that a little bit. He and Campbell are very different in terms of, of builds and roles and everything like that. Um, so maybe this pushes Malcolm Rodriguez out of getting a lot of snaps when they're in nickel stuff and there's only two linebackers on the field. But I think eventually it's going to be Campbell and Rodriguez together. And that is just a sawed off shotgun of a linebacking core. And I... I really can't wait to see what this group does together because for once, it feels like the Lions have a damn good group of linebackers. Yeah, and Campbell's so smart, too. His vision has increased every year um, that he was at Iowa. He got better at diagnosing. He's not just a physical marvel who's trying to figure out. He is a guy that plays linebacker very well. His instincts and vision have been honed, uh, and then he's just channeling that unreal athleticism and size right you see very few linebackers of his size inside linebackers of his size anymore um not to mention the fact that he can still move i feel like he's going to be an entrenched starter for them pretty quickly might not happen immediately because again they do have folks with experience that are there but it's going to be one of those things i mean even you know jack campbell is not brian erlacher but Brian Erlacher was a strong side linebacker when he got there and he was yeah. miscast and he played and played. And then Barry Minter got hurt and they slid him over and went, oh, this is the way it should have been. And he never left. Yeah. Right. And I feel like whenever Campbell gets to slot into that middle linebacker, he's not going to be the game's not going to be too fast for him. He's not going to be overwhelmed. He's going to be the guy wearing the green dot really quickly for that linebacking core. And once all that happens, like. I think, you know, we'll be sitting here seven years from now, eight years from now going, and Jack Campbell's still really good yeah. in other news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 18th pick wasn't that high, all things considered, for an eight, eight plus year starter. Uh, in terms of coach of the year, you and I both agree, going from one Campbell in Detroit to the next, Dan Campbell. It kind of feels like the momentum has been building for him for multiple years now. We're seeing that kind of investment in culture pay off. The talent is there. You know, they went on a, a really good run in the back half of last year after they finally, finally seemed to get over the hump of just snatching defeat from the jaws of victory in in new and interesting ways every single Sunday. I mean, it's at one point, Justin Tucker literally had to kick a record-breaking field goal to beat this team, and, and the Lions were always on the receiving end of that 
that type of stuff. They could not just freaking win games. And then after Miami or after the loss against Miami last year, they kind of switched some things up and it just turned into a threshing machine. Yeah. I think that momentum keeps building this year. And Dan Campbell, uh, which I know you also agree with, gets his first Coach of the Year uh, award. I hope it happens. Feels like he deserves it. Again, inertia can be a very difficult thing to turn around in the NFL in terms of that ability to just break a historical trend of not being able to win the close ones. And it doesn't seem like that really should be a thing because there's so much turnover every year in the NFL. Each team truly is really different. We are not, you know, 30 years ago where you could kind of stack players and and keep them. And, you know, dynasties year after year was just sort of a, it was a tough thing to break up. There's so much movement with free agency in the draft and windows are so much shorter, right? Coach doesn't win for three years. He's probably out. There's no like, oh, it's his teething period. We'll give him a couple more seasons. That's not a thing. And for Campbell and and really Brad Holmes to come in and say, we've got an idea. It's an identity. They sort of got Campbell got laughed at at his first press conference because he was Dan Campbell. (laughs) He was all amped up and talking about biting kneecaps and everybody focused on that and not like I'm going to hold players responsible. We're in a really, really tough football team. We're going to play smarter. And I think the most underrated thing about Dan Campbell is ability to self scout, right? His ability to say, no, nah, I'm not happy with the offense. I'm going to call plays. And then later say, I'm not the best one to be doing this. I'm going to hand that back off, right? He's been good in that CEO role in terms of understanding what people are good at, including himself. Seems fairly egoless there. Um, but at the same time, I would say strict with the standard of how we play football. And that seems to be what's turned the tide to where they win those closer games. Feels like it's time for him to get that recognition. And I think, uh, you know, coach of the year, at least in terms of the division, uh, would be, you know, ample recognition and, and rightfully so. I think what what maybe people were not paying attention to going back to that biting kneecaps press conference years ago at this point. And everybody was making fun of him and saying, ah, he's talking about biting kneecaps. It's so weird. Look at him being so eccentric. What they weren't paying attention to was all the players in the Lions locker room saying, fuck yeah, let's go bite some kneecaps. <laughs> right. That's what matters. The yeah. players bought in. Like, they eat kneecaps every single week now. They love it. Like, you look at Hard Knocks last year, some of the faces those guys were making in the meeting rooms, like, they would kill for that man. 100%. It matters. It matters. Uh, and for all those reasons, and more, by the way, <laughs> shocker, I'm picking the Lions to win the division. A lot of people are picking the Lions to win the division. They're probably the most popular pick to win the division. I think they're going to be a fantastic team. Um, they very well could push for a high seed in the NFC. They're going to have to compete with the Eagles. Assuming the Niners work out their quarterback situation, they're going to compete with them for it as well. But the Lions are potentially a complete, well-coached, talented football team that it's I I can't pick anybody other than them to be my early favorite yeah I'm gonna go with the Vikings in a sort of razor thin race which is you know they basically split with each other and sort of the Vikings win it on points or strength of schedule or whatever it is because the Vikings were not as good as their record last year but still a very good football team And their major deficiency was defense, not offense. And they've fixed that in a major way. So I'm not predicting a great fall for them, like maybe a regression to mean, but that would still be, that would still look something like 11 wins. And that's, you know, two wins better for the Lions. If they get 11 wins, they both get 11 wins. I think the Vikings might take it on whatever strength of schedule point totals, whatever it goes But you're still to. thinking just razor-thin margin. They're yeah. basically a much better division. I think every team in some substantive way has improved in this division. Chicago, obviously, because they had a ton of money to spend and it was their year to do it. Um, the Lions were already fantastic on offense, really needed some defensive help. Sounds the same for the Vikings. Vikings addressed it through coaching, not so many player additions. The Lions went heavy in the draft to get some defense and at key positions. And, you know, this is just, it feels like it's going to be 
a very strong division that beats the hell out of each other with a couple of really good teams. I could see two playoff teams coming out of this division for the first time in a bit, um, both with good chances to win. And I think that'd be exciting for NFC North fans in general. And, you know, if you told me at the end of the season that Chicago hit a hot streak and won the division, I'd be like, sure. If you told me that Jordan Love turned into a superstar and the Packers won their division, I'd just <laughs> chuck my laptop off the patio and walk away. But, I mean, either way, you could sell me on any of the four teams. I think probably the Packers are the least just because it really is a first full season for Jordan Love in the bright lights. Um, and the other teams are freaking good. Yeah, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Sure. Because, spoiler alert, when we get to the NFC East, EJ's been talking up Washington all offseason. He's big on Washington yeah. going into 2023. I doubt that you're going to have Washington as your number four team in the NFC East, but it's tough to pick a number four team in the NFC East because they're all good, just like NFC North. Which division between the NFC North and the NFC East do you think overall is better? Right now? You could even say who has the best number four team. Oh, who has the best worst team? And we use the term worst yeah. very loosely here. Uh, best last placed team in their own division. That's tough because the NFC East was wildly underrated last year. They were one of the toughest divisions mm -hmm. um, in terms of wins, in terms of um, you know improvement. Again, the Giants were much better than anybody thought they were. Um, Cowboys went strong. Obviously, everybody knows about the Eagles, and and you know the Commanders were. Not good for a bunch of reasons, but they've made some really substantive changes. So really, you're talking about... I wouldn't even say they weren't good. They were just solid. Right? Yeah, they were solid, but they, they, you know, again, looking up at the rest of the division, that's a great question because it, uh, there's two facets to that. One is, you know, who do you think is going to regress a little bit in the NFC East? Or do you think the commanders are going to take a jump out of the basement? And then who do you think is the worst team in the NFC North? <laughs> that, see, that's even harder for me to pick than the winner is who's number four. Right. I, I think, again, there's a case for, I don't say four. I'd, I'd probably say two. I think there's a case for two in the NFC North. I'm going to default. Oh, God. I don't know. I can't, it is I can't really, default to the Bears. Uh, I oh, I don't want to say the Packers are the worst either because right. that's going to trigger – Everyone. The apocalypse uh, yeah. of Jordan Love being good. I, I know the second I say they're going to finish last, he's going to be amazing. Yeah. And I don't think, I think the Lions are too solid in roster and coaching to regress to the And the, the Vikings are better. <laughs> and the Vikings are really good. They're, they would have to have something cataclysmic, right? They would have to have Kirk like injured early, but they've still got so much talent that a feels like a backup quarterback and Kevin O'Connell could adjust and win a fair number of games. But maybe the worst team, this is probably the most uh, fair slice on that. Maybe the worst team in both of those divisions is like an eight or nine win team. I was going to say, like, I, I, I'll i caveat this by saying the Packers finished fourth, but they're still above 500. Which I think Packers fans would take at this point, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's probably possible, but let's say they win eight games, right? And they're strong. They just lose a couple, you know, again, fourth quarter, they're in it. They, you know, they don't get the role kind of like, uh, you know, well, kind of like the Bears last year, quite frankly. Um, but, you know, I could see the last place team in both the NFC East and the NFC North being like eight win teams. I can't remember what my, what was my floor for the Packers? I'm going to look that up real quick. Six? I, I think that's what it was, right? Like, if, if the bottom completely came out, it was six. Yeah. I, I don't realistically expect that. No. Man, that's hard. This is a good division. This yeah. is a good division. And NFC East was better than people thought. So we'll get to that division second to last. We are going counterclockwise from the north. North, NFC, AFC, west, NFC, AFC, south, same thing. And then we'll get to NFC East and AFC East will be our last division in this series. But there's a lot of good football to talk about. And a lot of good teams. I really can't wait for week one because we're going to put, you know, that, that Packers-Bears question to the test immediately. Right off. In week one. I don't – is that a primetime game? I can't remember. It I probably is. I don't think it is, but I'm not sure. 
Bears Packers isn't prime time. God. Well, yeah, but this it's is, very this different. This is a bears. new world, huh? Very different Bears. Very different. <laughs> the Packers. Lions get a Week One primetime game, but not Bears Packers. Holy shit! Yeah. Well, it's a new day, and I don't think I like it very much. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll see you next week when we uh, we begin AFC North with the Cleveland Browns. See you guys later. Take care.